Okay, so if you're not here for My Agile is Not Your Agile, and that's okay, you're in the wrong place. You're more than welcome to stay, but you might be a bit disappointed. Um, my name is uh, David Crow. Um, I'm hope, normally at this point in a talk, I would open by saying, the toilets are here, here, and here, but if you don't know where the toilets are in your own house, I don't think I'm gonna be able to help you with that. Uh, my, like I said, I'm David Crow. Uh, I've been in and around Agile for 10 years. I've been working with um, uh, Jose on BCS Agile Committee for, shall we say, a number of years uh, without having to work out actually how many. Uh, I supported the introduction of Agile methods at the British Library. And the reason I'm doing this talk is because I wrote a master's dissertation, uh, The Agility Code, Deciphering Contemporary Agile Discourse. Um, which got me a distinction and so this is really based on that. Uh, I also, and this might become relevant later, have a postgraduate diploma in science and society. So I have drawn on some of the ideas from that in what I'm writing as well. Uh, my aims for this session are by the end you should have a high level idea of what discourse analysis is. You might not be prepared to do it but you'll know roughly what I'm doing with it. You'll be able to identify five common interpretive repertoires about Agile. Uh, you'll be able to use, identify the sorts of people who use uh, different types of repertoires and why, and how they're used together in order to achieve different goals. Uh, and I would encourage you to reflect on the language you use and why you use it, and be more critical about how people talk about Agile, including yourself. So let's start with a quick breakout. <clears throat> um, in a second, Ahmad will break you out into rooms for about three or four people, if that sounds about right, Ahmad. Um, but the questions I want you to talk about in your groups for about two or three minutes is, what do you mean when you talk about Agile? What do people who don't work in or with Agile on a regular basis mean when you talk to them about it? So for example, my other half has no idea what Agile is, and so I think he probably assumes that I'm a super flexible limber gymnast in my spare time. Uh, and uh, what problems are you trying to solve when you talk about Agile? And then when you come back, we'll use menti.com. Uh, so that's this here. Go to menti.com and type in the six digit code, uh, and we'll share it there. So. Uh, when you're ready, Amar, feel free to beam our intrepid adventurers down to their planets. Okay. Energizing. So if you could go to Menti, uh, to use the code 429051 and type in your four words uh, that you think represent Agile. Hey, we have words. Okay, so that's three responses. It's nice when these things actually work. Well and good setting them up, but then you sort of go, oh, what if it doesn't work? What if the technology breaks down when I need it the most? But yay, it's worked. Okay, I'll give you another couple of seconds to finish answering that. Fantastic. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So there's some really key words in there. The word mindset, it's interesting to see that coming up. And I think that's been coming out of these conversations more and more recently. Uh, collaboration, adapt people, um, which is good feedback, quality, change. Uh, manifesto, of course, is an interesting word. It's interesting that people keep coming back to the manifesto. Values, principles, again, okay. So a fairly predictable bunch of words, but also quite a diverse set of words. 
I think if I was talking to a group who were expecting me to talk about quality and inspection and um, continuous improvement, and I came to them starting to talk to them about being energized and adaptable and uh, changing, they might well not expect what I'm saying. So we might find ourselves on different pages of the same uh, conversation. Uh, and that can be really problematic. So I decided to do some research into the language that people use to talk about agility. And as a premise for that, so going into it, I was like, well, I don't think agile is just one thing. And having been to a number of conferences, I have frequently been in a room and I've gone, are they talking about agile? Are they talking about something near agile? Um, and I've never really disagreed with anybody. I've never sort of gone, oh, no, you're wrong. You shouldn't be here. But it's just clear they're taking a different approach to the subject as me. I think in your discussions, did you find that everybody had a slightly different idea of what we were talking about when we were talking about Agile? Give me nods. I can see some of you. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, did anybody find that everybody agreed with what they were saying? Give me a hand. Okay, so a couple of groups were more in agreement than others. That's pretty unusual, but not, not that surprising, I suppose. We're all trying to achieve different things at different times, and we use language in different ways in order to achieve those goals. So having conversations about language can identify when we're not talking about the same thing, or when we are talking about the same thing. Uh, when somebody means something different and perhaps more interesting, and when somebody has an agenda that's completely incompatible with yours, and perhaps we'll talk about some of the people who might have different agendas later. Uh, so I have to do a science bit uh, because I'm worth it. And uh, I did this research project over 13 long, long months. Um, and we started out with agile is a single word representing multiple con uh, concepts and that we find people talking at cross purposes. Uh, and it's almost as if language changes its uh, meaning depending on who's using it and why they're using it. I used a technique called discourse analysis uh, and it explores written and spo uh, spoken discourse. So that's conversations. Anything where somebody is putting text out there and responding to it. Um, it was popularized by the archaeology of knowledge, Michael Foucault, Michel Foucault in the 60s. Um, I always feel a bit bad mentioning Foucault in a science and technology type group because most people hear that name and go, oh, that's not science. Um, it kind of is science, but it's not the same as the sort of hard science that physicists are doing or even computer scientists. So discourse analysis asks three questions. It says, what is this discourse trying to achieve? Um, is this an argument between two people who are trying to persuade each other the benefits of their approach? Is it a salesman trying to sell you something? Is it somebody trying to explain why what you just said upset them? And then it says, well, how are the people approaching this discourse in order to achieve that goal? So is somebody making a lot of I statements and being very emotive, or are they making a lot of rational, here are some facts type statements? And what resources are available to perform this activity so that question refers to what sort of cultural resources are they pulling on in order to achieve that? So, for example, are they using metaphors? Uh, are they using stories which are common between different uh, versions in order to understand what's going on? Uh, and then I've put four nice long words at the bottom. Uh, discourse analysis is naturalistic, anti-realistic, uh, constructionist and phenomenological. Great word. But effectively, what it says is, discourse analysis doesn't seem to find out what the truth is, because, it, because there's probably not a truth. If you've ever had an argument with somebody you love or you hate, um, you will know that there's no one version of how that discussion went that is absolutely true. And everybody who was involved in that discussion or was watching it will have a slightly different version of events. So... I, I, when I go through this, you will find quite quickly, you might disagree with some of my conclusions, but that's absolutely fine. Um, 
it's quite possible that I haven't seen things that you're seeing. Um, that doesn't necessarily invalidate the conclusions. In fact, it might reinforce the conclusions. Um, so do you have, is that clear with everybody? We don't need, uh, you're not gonna be sent away to do coursework on this. So I think you're fine with that overview. Thank you for your feedback there, Brian. It is noted. Uh, what did I look at? I used some selection criteria. Uh, basically, I didn't want to transcribe actual conference uh, presentations, so I avoided doing that. I focused very much on agile rather than techniques like Kanban specifically or Scrum specifically. I was agile as a sub subject. And is it relatively recent? Uh, and the sort of places I started were, what are the co-authors of the manifesto saying? What are iconic bits and publications saying? And what are the wider community saying on blogs? I should note that although I aimed for contemporaneous uh, content, some of the stuff came from longer ago than that uh, because it's a bit more interesting than some of the stuff that was more, written more recently. So it, it was loosely based on those criteria. Uh, the coding process is fascinating if you've ever done it. In fact, it's pretty painful. You start by going through all the texts and you pick up on the keywords and the ideas that people are talking about and you make a note of all of them. And then you go through everything and can start to compare the codes and say, oh, is this code the same as that code? So if somebody said uh, agile means quality, when somebody's talking about quality over here, are they meaning the same as the person talking about quality over here? Can I merge those codes? Or have I discovered that there's two conceptions of quality there that I need to discover? So that's selective coding. What happens quite quickly is as you're selective coding, you go, oh, I wonder if anybody's thought about this. And you go back through all 40 articles and go, hmm, okay, I found some more instances. So you have this loop of open coding and selective coding. And then you go to theoretical coding, and that's when you start to go, well, these selective codes sort of fit into more these themes, and I can draw them together like this. Um, and that's when I started to pull out some interpretive repertoires. So in total, I ended up with 965 distinct codes. Uh, this is across 40 articles. Uh, 2,427 unique codes per art in, in, in articles. So although a code might appear more than once in an article, it's only counted once there. And in total- what do you mean by, sorry to interrupt, what do you mean by code in this instance? So a code is um, when you're identifying a concept and you're assigning it a, a symbol, a code. And very often in this case, it was me going, like I say, um, somebody is talking about quality. Are they talking about quality in the same sense? Are there divergent meanings of quality here? Do I need to pick them apart or can they be clustered together? Does that make sense? I don't actually know who asked that. It was, yes, it does. Thank you. Brilliant. Was Alistair. Uh, and then theoretical coding is at a higher level where you're going, okay, so how do I get from A to Z? The codes, the 965 codes, uh, run from acceptance tests at the top of the list to zealots at the bottom of the list. Um, just to give you an idea of the broadness of topics. Um, the next slide will probably lead some of you to try and guess which of these people used which of those two phrases that I've just mentioned. Um, but as you can see, I've gone for a pretty wide range of people. There's a couple of people there who signed the manifesto uh, there's a couple of people you might recognise who didn't sign the manifesto, and there's a couple of people you might not recognise. I also went for some larger publications, so I was quite keen to see how the wider business community was talking about Agile, as well as the Agile business communities coming together. Yeah, um, Jose is sort of a glossary of terms, but you know how when you make a stock and you boil it for hours to make it into a demi glass. It's, it's like a glossary of terms that's been boiled down for hours to, to come up with something really tasty and interesting. Mm -hmm. Food metaphors always Good. work, I say. I've known him for too long. <laughs> uh, 
so here's a mind map of the concepts as I came into it. I'm not going to analyse this because this was me trying to dump my brain onto a piece of paper at about three o'clock in the morning one day. So uh, I just illustrated the complexity of what we're dealing with here. So across 40 articles, uh, 27 were from business publications, 20 were self-published, so things like blogs I considered self-published, and other is where um, organisations have published stuff. So Agile Alliance published a couple of articles and I would consider them to be other because I don't think they're a business publication, but I also don't think the people publishing them are self-published. We have 10 academics, three agile practitioners, two business leaders, 21 consultants. The word consultant was fairly loosely defined here. Um, I, it was effectively anybody who gives advice to people on a professional basis. And I sort of included in that and try to sell them stuff. So not all consultants do do that, but quite a lot of consultants do that. So they, they were in together. But it was basically advice giving whether or not they're being paid for it. Uh, there was one corporate author, i.e. Uh, the individual who wrote it wasn't identified, it was written by an organisation. And 14 manifesto co-authors are represented there. Um, there are 51 authors but 40 articles. So that's why they, these don't add up to 40 all the time. Who were they targeted at? Uh, two were roughly targeted at business leaders, 23 were sort of uh, targeted at the wider agile communities, 24 business leaders and two interested persons. This was where people seem to be introducing concepts for people who probably aren't business leaders and probably aren't agile at the moment but wanted to find out something about what agility was. And what were those documents trying to do? Uh, they were trying to persuade people, inform people, demonstrate things, criticise people and caution people. Um, and so then we come to the conclusion of all that coding. And I identified five key interpretive repertoires. What's an interpretive repertoire? It's a common way of talking about a subject which invoke the same stories, metaphors, references, characters, and it sort of creates a motif or a theme which people latch on to. So, for example, I would argue, without having done any research, that um, if we're talking about Kanban, a really common interpretive repertoire would be visualising flow. So the ability to visualise what you're doing is probably a core conversation that people have with regards to Kanban. Uh, if you could throw comments down here, I'm pointing to where they are on my screen, they're probably not in the same place on your screen. Um, have you got any ideas about what sorts of repertoires might come up in analysis of agile texts? Very quickly, just throwing some ideas. Unless you've read the article, in which case this is cheating. I'm still wondering quite what Brian means about me being... Uh, is he suggesting I'm an unrealist in my Facebook feed? So, David, you're asking to put in chat um, possible repertoires, like themes yeah. or things if, like that? So if you can't, don't worry and I'll just move on. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> okay, well, I'll... I'll put you out of what can only be your misery. Ah, misery. Oh. <laughs> it's interesting you've thrown Jira in there. It sort of did come up, but not in the way you're thinking about. It'll be interesting to see how that fits in in a minute. Um, I am not a fan of Jira, but that's for personal reasons rather than for research reasons. Scrum did come up again, yes. Uh, teams definitely came up, not Microsoft Teams, which I think I hold in as much contempt as Jira at the moment. Collaboration definitely comes up, yes. Values comes up, mindset sort of comes up. Although, Saf, you are cheating because I happen to know you've read it. Uh, yes, all of those things come up, but probably not in the way you're going to expect. So let's have a look at the first one, historical inevitability. The historical inevitability of Agile was the first thing that came up. Yes, the AIC definitely comes up, Mike. Don't worry about that. Uh, corruption of Agile. 
uh, locus of control, organizational agility, and insufficiency of agile. So these were the five big things that I pulled out of what I read. There were plenty of other things to pull out of it. These were the five big ones. Historical inevitability. So there were nine articles that wrote about historical inevitability. And uh, this uh, repertoire talks about providing meaning to the agile movement. It argues that agile is the natural evolution of management. So those of you who are familiar with Lalu's reinventing organizations uh, will be familiar with his idea of the teal organization being at the moment the ultimate uh, idea of the um, yeah, the ultimate uh, goal of organizations is to be teal. And he argued, as you can, uh, and Valo argued up here, uh, that even if the manifesto hadn't been written, uh, uh, um, something very similar would exist and it would probably be called agile. Its inevitability is often invoked as a response to waterfall as well. So very often you get people saying, Waterfall's bad, waterfall's terrible, and that's why we're agile. But at no point does anybody actually go, this is what waterfall is. Uh, and they don't really define what agile is on the flip side of that either. So you kind of end up with a very bizarre situation where agile is definitely not waterfall. And if anybody has actually read the original paper on water that defined the term waterfall, actually it's a lot more agile than it's used in this discourse. <laughs> Um, and Lambdin comments that agility is actually for management something that will just help them do the waterfall objectives faster. So there he's drawing a, a suggestion that it's not just about doing things better, it's also about um, changing the way you think about doing things. Um, as such, agile is a logical response to the stage, uh, status quo and it's a reaction against bureaucracy. Um, I'm kind of reminded when I was thinking about this of, um, you know, in the 1960s, there were those great 1950s and 60s, great Russian paintings of really stylized, heroic farmers reaching out to the future with their sickles. Um, or um, some really interesting Marxist histories where everything is read in the everything that happens in the past um, is leading towards a logical point in the future. So Marx was a little bit guilty of this when he said, you know, every struggle that's happened in the past is a way for the workers of the world to unite. Um, I think it sort of paints agile as the glorious future. It's it's Olympic agile. It's better, faster, cheaper. Um, and non-adoption is posed as a disadvantage. So a lot of people here are talking about um, not being agile as being something that's going to cause you problems. Corruption of agile uh, actually started out in my notes as agile is dead. Um, and about 11 articles mentioned this. Um, specifically uh, the death of agility now i widened it slightly to be corruption because this is where ideas about the agile industrial complex come in um, so it's not just that agile is dead but also that it's somehow become the opposite of agility and people are misusing it so denning talks about um organizations that are falling short of some kind of platonic ideal of what agility is so you know we we all know what a platonic square is it's a perfect square it's you know it's got perfect right angles perfectly equal lengths um, but if you've ever drawn a square you'll know that a platonic square is impossible to draw and it will always be slightly less than perfect the same is true with agile i think a lot of people have this sort of platonic ideal in their head and then they compare what you're doing against it and they're like, oh no, th this isn't agile, it is a corrupted version. So you get lots of language like agile sweatshops. Um, people say when implemented correctly, 
Um, they refer to badly done agile, feature factories, fast food model. This is the idea where your customers come in and shout orders at them and you're just supposed to deliver the factory and the features as fast as possible. Agile in name only, faux agile dot scrum. It's an appeal to purity and I'm sorry, uh, Saf, uh, there is no true Scotsman. No comment. <laughs> Other people commented on the Agile Industrial Complex. Um, I would argue that the Agile Industrial Complex is sort of the emergence of a priesthood. So they're the people who know the secrets and can do the rituals. Um, Vallow criticizes hippies who are um, leading cool Agile activities, for example. My concern about this, <laughs> So I, I'm not going to go through this and say, yeah, these are correct or they're wrong. My, uh, what I'm saying is these are conversations that people are having being called out. And my concern with this is that it echoes what's known as the deficit model. Now, the deficit model came out of um, studies in scientific communication in the 1980s. And you might have seen headlines like these. Um, so typically, let's look at this headline here. One in four Americans don't know the Earth orbits the sun. Okay, that sounds pretty bad. 25% of Americans don't know some really basic astronomy. But let's have a quick think about how they were assessing this information. First of all, this type of research generally is done by market organizations who stop people on their way out of the supermarket after they've just done a shop with three kids in the shopping trolley and then give them a science exam, which they haven't prepared for, to find out just how intelligent they are. And so you get people saying, oh, I don't know, it's, it's oh, which orbits which? Oh, it's the sun orbits the earth. I don't think that they necessarily reflect that. So what you end up with is you have a group of experts who have all the knowledge, and I'm really putting this in inverted commas because I don't believe it's true, who are looking down on non-experts who don't have the knowledge and are getting it wrong in some way, shape or form. And the assumption is that you can fix the wrongness by giving people more information. Um, and we know that's not true. In the 90, or so the early 2000s, there was research done into genetically modified organisms. And the theory was people who oppose genetically modified organisms don't really know what uh, GMOs are. They don't really understand the dangers. But actually, when they did the research, it turned out they knew more than the average person. Uh, but they had come to a different conclusion. Um, I think this is quite dangerous when it comes to agile thinking, because effectively it sets up a group of people as being experts who have knowledge and them saying to other people, no, you're wrong, you've got to do it my way. And I think that's quite dangerous. That doesn't mean that I necessarily endorse or, or deny the existence of the, uh, the discourse. The next subject is locus of control. Uh, so 29 articles talked about this, which is by far the, the most commonly spoken about topic. And it's about capabilities and, abil uh, and ability. So effectively, it's about identifying agile in practice as a heuristic. So you can look at something and go, that is or that is not agile, depending on where the control is for the process. Um, the word power is referenced uh, 208 times across 29 articles. So this is very much about where the power is and how people are doing things. People talk about self-organizing cross-functional teams. So that sort of touches on the collaboration that somebody mentioned early, earlier. Uh, it's anti-bureaucracy. So it, it's very much theory X versus theory Y. Um, where, where am I? Sorry, I'm losing myself on my screen. Values were mentioned in more than 87% of articles. So there is this big gap between what is and what ought to be. So David Hume said the only way to get from what is, as in the world is an awful place, to what ought to be, um, the world should be more like this, is to insert values. Um, and what I think we're seeing with this argument is an insertion of values. And those values 
are largely around being more person, value, product, uh, human centered. Um, and although this does talk about artifacts, roles and methodologies, it's more focused on what is produced, who produces it and how they produce it than it necessarily is the volume that they're producing, which has historically been the focus of management output. It's very much about outputs versus outcomes. Organisational agility, there is, this is a difficult topic because a lot of people don't agree that an organisation as a whole can be agile. I'm still on the fence about this. Um, but there's a view that it shouldn't just be restricted to software. Um, one that both Coburn, uh, that Coburn agrees with, by the way. Um, and on the flip side, uh, Lambdin says working software is the primary measure of progress. It assumes that you're always achieving outcomes by delivering software. Um, there's a tension between what can be made agile and what can't be. So if we got in some cases and I'm not mentioning names but it is on the screen uh, have we got a form of bureaucratization of agility in the name of achieving organizational agility um, and how does that play out so 17 articles talked about that um, and we'll see who was talking about that in a second but I you can probably guess who's talking about doing more work in order to create the agile enterprise and then the final uh, topic is the insufficiency of Agile. Agile is limiting but a necessary foundation for success. So the practices aren't fixed and will continue evolving. And so some of the ideas for what needs to happen here is faster feedback, uh, Agile values outside of product design, simplification of processes. Uh, and then other people suggest that people should look also at lean design research, lean usability, lean enterprise, beyond budgeting theory of constraints, throughput accounting, design thinking, DevOps, Marshall's organizational therapy, and there's even talks about extending it to human resource practices. Again, the key point here is what people are saying is, agile as it stands at the moment isn't enough, so it needs to broaden its view, um, and it needs to add new ideas. So who wrote about what? Academics, uh, us critics, uh, largely wrote about insufficiency. It's a lot easier to write a criticism than it is to suggest solutions. Um, so I think that that's really what's happening with the academics there. Uh, the manifesto co-authors, unshockingly, wrote about uh, corruption of agile, often as a critique. So it's, we need to get back to our values. <laughs> Uh, consultants largely wrote about the locus of control, which is interesting because it suggests consultants are taking that aspect of agility quite seriously. Uh, practitioners are concerned about corruption and about control. Uh, and then this last group, they were all talking about corruption and insufficiency, but there are only three of them, so I kind of tend to ignore them a little bit. Um, but I don't think there are any surprises about what these people are talking about personally. Uh, and I'm certainly not surprised to see that consultants are taking a series of topics. Locus of control, so here's what you need to change. Historical inevitability, oh, agile is the future of management. You need to really invest in this with us in order to become agile. And by the way, it shouldn't just be your product teams that are agile, it should be all of us. Yes, LOC does sell. Yes, exactly, Brian. Yeah. So who wrote about what the flip side of this is 78% of consultants talk about historical inevitability, which I think reinforces that idea that it provides a reason of being for what they're doing. Manifesto consultant uh, co-authors were the majority speakers about corruption and agile. Locus of control is consultants again. Organisational agility is consultants again. Exactly. And so then this looks fun, right? Uh, so then I did an analysis of who spoke about what and how they weave those different topics together. So this is a fun Venn diagram um, and each of these little eggs represents one of the topics and it's the topic that's touching it. And then they all overlap with all the other topics and each of the little dots represents one of the articles 
and then it, the color of the dot tells us what type of person was writing in that article. So here we have a, par, a paper written by three authors, um, two of whom are consultants, one of whom is a manifesto co-author. And I happen to know that was an article published in HBR and there's only four articles published in HBR about Agile, so you can work out which one that is very, very quickly. Um, but you can see that that's intersecting locus of control, historical inevitability and organisational agility. So very quickly, the types of things that you see woven together are corruption and insufficiency. Misapplication of Agile is problematic, but you shouldn't be constrained by it. And this poses the idea that corruption leads to insufficiency, i.e. corrupt Agile isn't enough to do what you're trying to do. But the, the insufficiency of Agile also leads to corruption. So you have this sort of cycle, vicious cycle, that's going to reinforce itself. And this is why the corruption discourse is quite important, because you need to think, OK, are we going away from what we're trying to achieve here? Do we need to bring in something from outside our job in order to expand our view? Control and insufficiency also unsurprisingly overlap. Uh, you need to look beyond agile in order to be agile and de devolution of authority is at the heart of agile. Uh, corruption and control, you will be shocked to learn, anybody who's lived in the 21st century will be shocked to learn that hoarding power leads to corruption. Yeah. Uh, so again, what we're seeing here is the, uh, the tension between agility and bureaucracy. We've got a triple intersection here. That's exciting. Look, three colours on one hexagon. Uh, tension between uh, insufficiency and corruption is often actually about the non-distribution of power. So if all three of these are present in a conversation, this is a subtle hint for you who are going out there and talking to people. Uh, if you hear all three of these happening in a single conversation, that's really a call for what I'm calling here continuous improvement. And I'm deliberately using a 1990s term for that because actually the solution to a lot of these problems are, are not big new ideas. These ideas have been hanging around forever. We just need to pay a bit more attention to them. Uh, organizational agility and control a big amount of tension between these two concepts and nobody has really worked out how to solve them yet um, things like safe take a interesting approach to it but i feel they're more constraining than opening personally um, but there's definite tension there and i think this is the final combo inevitability control and organizational agility so Effectively, we're on this sort of downward slope where organisations will in inevitably become agile. But the question is what that actually means and where the control will lie in that. And there's this move from the concrete, what we've got at the moment, to what's the ideal. And beyond that, there's, the horizon is relatively limited, so people have to speculate beyond that perspective. So you need, if you're having this sort of conversation, Think about what the motivations to change are, how change has to happen differently at the top level of the organisation to the bottom level of the organisation, and how the change needs to permeate the organisation. So think about cultural change. But it's also a message of hope. So in many ways, this is the one which is sort of out there going, actually, this isn't just something that's happened. There's a big, exciting future for us all potentially profitable so woven agility uh, I'll cover this very quickly I'll put some nice long words on here because I know you like them so agile is not catacrestic so catacrestic means the word is used inappropriately a catacresis that is commonly done is where people inadvertently replace the word mitigate with militate so you end up militating your risks and they invade your country or something. Um, so this suggests that maybe agile is being used incorrectly. It's not the right word to use. We should be using another word. But there is no concept of platonic agile. There's no true Scotsman, as I said earlier. So therefore, it's not a misuse of words. So it's not catacrestic. 
that suggests then maybe it's a homonym. Maybe we've got one word that sounds like another word. So maybe the word agile that we're using just sounds like the word agile that other people are using. And really, they're different words. Um, so, for example, we're agile because we constantly change how we do things is not necessarily a true statement. Um, however, there isn't, there's no homonyms that we're aware of. It's not like I can talk about agile in the Kanban sense versus agile in the organisational sense. That doesn't make sense as we talk about these words at the moment. They're, they're, they're not that distinct. There's definite blurring of boundaries. So therefore, we have to come to the conclusion that, and here's a great word, it doesn't have a single resolvable meaning. It's polysemous. So um, if you look in a dictionary, homonyms will be, so for example, word check. The word check will appear three times in a dictionary. The first uh, may be spelt with an E-Q-U-E, and it's about money. Uh, the second would be, um, about chess and the third would be about verifying something so it's a verb to go and check something um, but actually they all started out as polysemes and polysemes in the dictionary are the one two three fours that you get under a single word in the dictionary so there's a distinction between homonyms and polysemes but they can turn into each other so if some of this uh, these categories continue, you might find out that Agile turns into a bunch of homonyms rather than being a single concept. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking, is the manifesto still relevant? Because I think it's a question that came up a lot, not because I'm asking, not because I'm personally suggesting it's not relevant. So let's have a quick game of bingo. We're going to go back over to uh, uh, Menti and just very quickly have a conversation between yourselves about what repertoires you've seen in action, whether you've seen them in combination, which you've used and what they achieved. Uh, and I will move the mentee on and it allows you to vote on those. So you can have a discussion and vote on that and we'll come back in three minutes. Are you ready for this Ahmad or do you want me to stretch it out for a second? No, I'll just do the vinyl ch checks and then I'll send them across. Okay. Energized. Excellent. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope that wasn't too painful. Let's have a quick look at the mentee. Technology is great. I forgot to ask. I forgot to show that on the mentee. So sorry. But you can all press your buttons now very quickly. OK. Oh my God. Do we have to actually choose? I'm sort of interested to see which ones people haven't seen as well. So if there is one that you haven't seen, feel free to uh, type that in the uh, chat. And that'll be an interesting discussion later. The numbers there just represent the order in which I typed them in, which is literally the order they appear in my paperwork. Okay, there we go. Interesting. Okay, so we've got a few feedback. We'll let that run for a couple of seconds and we'll come back to that after the next slide, okay? Uh, so I just came up with a couple of things that I drew out of the research that I did. I think it's fairly clear that there is a move, if you're going to be agile, at least in the sense of the language people use consistently in what I read, that there is a shift from inward focused organisations to outward focused organizations. So these are organizations that exist to exist, to organizations that exist in order to make customers happy and to delight them. At the same time, there is a shift from reserved power to distributed power. So this is very much a D 
democratic shift in the way uh, organisations run. So instead of all the power being held at the top, the people who are actually doing the work are able to make decisions. I think this was actually um, anticipated 40 years ago. The Andon Cord on a Toyota's production line is very much an example of distributed power. Um, it can also be used as a source of corruption as well, but that's worth bearing in mind. So the Agile journey is really a shift from this sort of bureaucratic reserve power inward focused organization that cares more about its shareholders than it does its customers to a much more democratic yeah so somebody's mentioned digital transformation i my problem with that is it, the word digital because you don't have to be digital to make this shift and I think it's quite dangerous to suggest that to be digital, you need to do something very specific. Uh, but yeah, there's probably an overlap as well. Uh, I'm not going to say that digital transformation isn't related to this. I'm just not deliberately labelling it that. Should we have a quick back look at that menti very quickly? So I'm not shocked to see corruption and control are probably the two most talked about. Uh, and then corruption straight after that. Um, if you, I mean, if we don't get a chance to talk about this in a second, I would love to hear more about your experiences with these different repertoires. And if you can think of any others, um, I'm going to tell you my LinkedIn address at the end, or you can just drop it in the chat and I'll make sure I save that before I leave. Um, but yeah, so if you think there are other repertoires, I'd be fascinated to hear them. I have two more slides and then I am done. So the other thing is, I think who doesn't love a two by two matrix by the way like is there any point in going to if it doesn't have a two by two matrix uh it's how all the best management is done uh so i think there's if we consider there to be two axes one's mindset and one's practices uh, i think we have organizations which have got established management practices and bureaucratic mindsets and they're they're your traditional organization uh, think about big government departments, think about uh, organisations that have been trading for years and have got no real need to change what they're doing. Uh, they tend to have a bunch of characteristics which I've put on the screen, but I'm not going to read through, but I'm sure you can capture it if that's what you're interested in. If you change the mindset but don't change the practices, you end up with, <laughs> you end up with a frustrated organisation. So this is where you've got the traditional hierarchy, um, but people are trying to think in a more agile way. So they're going, I want to make this change, but they're unable to make the change. You've got people who will become quite angry. I would also suggest if you've got a frustrated organisation, you've probably got people who are leaving in droves. Um, that's probably a pattern to look for there. Sath, stop causing trouble. Uh, then we have uh, a pseudo agile organization. So this is an agile that's got the practices So they have a daily stand up and they have a Kanban board But it means absolutely nothing because the power is all held by a manager who makes all the decisions and They're reporting to somebody who cares about a red amber green report Rather than the experiences of what's happening on the floor and where the customers are happy um, Organizations like this a lot of people sort of become very blinkered. They won't notice what they're doing. Um, you can get frustration down here, but that's more typically where somebody's used to the mindset and is recognizing it's not happening. So for example, if I was in a pseudo agile organization, which I'm sure I'm not at the moment, but were I in such an organization, I would be quite frustrated. And then finally, we've got the agile organization. And I think the logical conclusion there is that we have both practices and uh, mindset, and we have something that's much more dynamic, responsive, and focused on customers. I came up with an acrostic, because like a two by two matrix is cool, but what's even more cool is an acrostic, right? So this is cool. The, this is the way to remember what the key messages from this are. First of all, so you can see it spells out Agile. I hope you've noticed this because I'm very proud of this. First of all, be aware of the diverse meanings of Agile in the, in the room and in the world more widely. So if you're writing or talking about agility, make sure that you know what you're talking about and that you've conveyed that 
at the top of the talk. Then gauge the meaning of what you're talking about in respect of who you're talking to. So if you start talking about it in a certain way and you can feel the room chill because all the directors were talking about something completely different, be aware of that. And that's actually a time to go back to what do you mean by agile rather than trying to plow on and hope they'll overlook the fact that you're talking about completely different things. Being deliberately vague is definitely an option. It's definitely one I've seen employed by consultants. Uh, use interpretive repertoires to guide what you say. So we might argue that some of these are bad repertoires and we shouldn't use them, but actually they can be useful. So we know that historical inevitability and organisational agility have probably got a fairly strong dynamic tension. And so you can sort of use historical inevitability to build up what you're trying to sell to someone, for example. Now, I'm not necessarily up for selling stuff, but you could do that. Listen for the interpretive repertoires in what people are saying back to you. So that could be a red flag that there's a communications challenge. So if you're talking about um, the locus of control shifting within an organisation and they're saying, yes, but agile's not enough, are you talking about the same things at that moment or do you need to stop, to take a breath and sort of redirect the conversation? And finally, engage with metaphors and stories that have common meaning. So... Um, I haven't talked much about metaphors and I want to talk about it more and I can't do it now. But when you're using metaphor to talk about historic inevitability, for example, are you doing that in a way that is common to them? Um, are there perhaps other metaphors and stories that you can use to sort of draw them into your version of what you're talking about rather than what they were talking about? And that is it.